Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 381 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, my good man, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? I'm doing good, Joe. How about you? <laughs> Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. That is the truth. Let's dive straight into part one. We're going to start, of course, with the review part of the show. One card that took place last Friday at the Quiet Cannon Country Club um, in Montebello, California. Over here, it was a Tom Loeffler show. Um, just one fight to mention, really. Just the main event. Sergei Bohachuk, the Ukrainian fighter, now 22-1. and one. Still never gone the distance in any of his fights. 22 KO wins, 1 KO loss. Um, this time he was able to knock out in round 6 Nathaniel Gallimore. Um, Gallimore now 22-7 and seven with a draw. I think that's only the second time he's been stopped. It was for the WBC Continental America's Super Welterweight title. Gallimore stopped on his feet in that sixth round. Really, really, really good fight, actually, while it lasted. Um... I managed to get a stream. It wasn't, you know, televised over here, but it was just an all-out war. It really, really was. I had it 2-2 going into round five, so it was a really close fight in the first four rounds. Both guys were throwing bombs. Bohachuk was landing some real vicious-looking uppercuts, but obviously Gallimore, been around the block, was able to take the shots, and um, very durable, you know. He's been in there with a who's who of names at 154 and in and around those weights, and to actually get a stoppage, against him is quite a rare thing to do I think only the the the, uh, the towering inferno Sebastian Fundora managed to do it so for Boa Chuck to get a scalp like this you know on his on his slate by knockout was very very impressive but um Gallimore really put it on Boa Chuck as well in those first few rounds but I guess the punching power of Boa Chuck did end up getting to Gallimore so a very very you know important win for Boa Chuck, because I think he's shown us something again there. I did say if he loses to Gallimore, which I thought was very, very possible. If he were to lose, we'd know where his ceiling is. But I think here he did impress. He really did. And it was a you know, it was a great win. Probably one of his best wins he has. So um yeah, it's it's still it still makes for exciting fights, I think, down the line for him. Um elsewhere uh, in another part of the USA, it was on Friday again. This one was at the Castleton Banquet and Conference Center in New Hampshire, USA. Over here, heavyweight Otto Wallin now 25 and one, a unanimous decision there over eight rounds against Hellerman Olguin, who's now nine and five with a draw. Um, yeah, didn't get the stoppage there, Otto Wallin, but nonetheless, good to see him back out. And now moving to the Wembley Arena card that took place, of course, in London. It was live on BT Sport pay-per-view. I think it was, I'm going to guess, on ESPN in the States. Uh, could be wrong. Um, I'm going to come to you in a moment, Eddie, but my experience with this card was kind of wild. I was at home, and I was going to go to a friend's house to watch the card, um, you know, at their house, then I had a last minute phone call, I want to say it was about half four, half five, um, and the card, I think, started on TV at seven, but obviously the doors opened, the first fight started at, I guess, five, half five, something like that, I get a phone call from um, Michael Hunter, and um, he was obviously in town to be at the fight, obviously, those that listen to the show will know he's a good friend of mine, and he called me and said, hey, we've got we've got a spare ticket. So it was like a mad rush. I literally had to just throw on clothes. I had to get on free trains to get there. And it was like, <laughs> it was just crazy. It was so stressful. I didn't get time to eat or anything. I just had to rush out the door. And um, I did end up getting there, you know, on time. I didn't miss any 
any major fights on the undercard. But it was great to be there. Great to see 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 Mike and spend time with him, of course, which um, I hadn't done in person for, for for a long time. And just great to be at the fights with him. Um, you know, it's fantastic. You know, for the fans as well to get to see him, take pictures with him, and all the rest of it. But it was great to be at boxing um, uh, again, especially for a card like this. I say a card like this. The card wasn't fantastic in terms of the undercard, but the main event to be there for Anthony Yard's marquee moment. You know, his his his, his second attempt at a world title felt right to me. You know, I had to be there, known Anthony Yard for a long, long time. Um, so yeah, it was great to be there for that. But without getting into the rest of that, um, we're going to start with the undercard. Tommy Fletcher with a win. I'm not sure if I said it on last week's show or not, but I had a little look. Tommy Fletcher, six foot seven cruiserweight, three and oh, three KOs, getting in with a five foot eight um, journeyman, seven wins, 96 losses, one draw. Only been stopped three or four times in those 96 losses. And Tommy Fletcher, you know, young guy, three and oh, three KOs. I thought this is probably going to go the distance. Not many people actually stop Daryl Sharp. And I noticed that Daryl Sharp had a fight lined up in in a few weeks' time. So if he gets stopped, then he won't be getting that second payday. So I thought there's that you know there's some smart money to put money on Tommy Fletcher for the points win. Two to one it was, and that came flying in with ease. Um, I was really happy about that one. So great stuff there for Tommy Fletcher banking those those six rounds there. Um, nearly a foot in height difference, something that. Um, I guess you've you've uh, been close to Eddie in the past, being on that disadvantage end. But elsewhere on the undercard, Moses Itauma, the young the young eighteen year old heavyweight, hoping to break Mike Tyson's record of becoming the quickest heavyweight world champion. Now one and zero, a knockout for him. I think it was in fourteen seconds of the first round. His opponent Marcel Bode, two and one, now two and two. Um, pretty much the first shot that got landed he went straight down I think he probably could have got up but he didn't fancy it and that was the end of that it was over very quickly but great to be at Moses Atalma's debut as well for myself to see him um, in the ring from just a few meters away Um, it's great when you're at a top fighter's pro debut someone that's tipped for massive massive things it's great to say I was there and I was there Um, Sean Noakes as well on the card with a knockout he scored a knockout in round five against Santiago Garces Um, Sean Noakes now 4-0 I was quite surprised to see that thought that one would probably go the distance but Santiago Garces like I say stopped there in the fifth round of a six rounder now 4-13 and with three draws um Wins as well for Joshua Frankham and Charles Frankham, both with with wins there on points. Uh, Carol Itauma, the brother of Moses Itauma, that I just spoke about, that heavyweight, 18 years of age. Um, Yeah, Carol Itauma, the brother, gets knocked out here by the Argentinian Ezekiel Moderna, now 29 and 10. Um, Carol Itauma loses his O. It was a massive, massive shock. He's now 9 and 1. Um, It was for the vacant WBC International Light Heavyweight title. Um... Yeah, terrible, terrible. I mean, Carol Wittalmer obviously was a huge favourite, huge favourite. I can't even tell you the numbers. He was that big of a favourite. No one expected this to happen. But I had a little look at Ezekiel Moderna. Obviously, he was much more you know, experienced as a pro and stuff like that. And I looked at some of the names and I thought, this is a fight I'm not really going to touch in terms of betting. I think... Um, Deep down, I kind of thought Itama would, of course, win, but I didn't think he would walk through this guy. I thought it was going to be maybe uh, a points win for him, you know, after quite a tough fight, as you always kind of get with these Argentinian fighters, you know, that come over here. They seem to be tough, tough guys, the Argentinians, the Mexicans, um, as we all know, but... No, I wouldn't have predicted him to get knocked out and knocked out in the fashion that he did get knocked out in um, in that fifth round, down really, really heavy from a right hand to the head. Um, I think he kept getting caught with that same shot as well, if I'm not mistaken, Itauma. Um So yeah, terrible stuff for him, especially as you know he's he, he's just been knocked out there, and his brother was just about to make his debut. You know, just a mo- just a matter of moments later. What's that got to do to your mental state? You know, seeing your brother get iced for the first time. Um, but yeah, Carol Itauma needs to obviously bounce back from that, but it's a terrible look for him. Um, he, he finds himself in a really, really difficult place because it was his chance as well to pick up a regional title here, the WBC International, like I say, in the same division as the main event. Obviously, 
for, for Baturbiev's light heavyweight title. So this would have been a chance for him to perhaps get a world ranking with the WBC, and he'd be well in conversation, you know, for a fight with one of those guys, the winner of the main event, in the near future. So, yeah, he's, 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 he's screwed up there. Um, so devastation for him, obviously, all the best to him in his comeback. Um, elsewhere on the card as well, was a bit of a kind of mad fight. No one really understood why it was even on the card, but we saw Artem Dalakian, um, now 22-0, a defense there of his WBA flyweight world title against David Jimenez, who's now 12-1. and um, I can't say I saw most of this fight here. I was kind of going uh, back and forth from my seat to, like the bar area and back and we were kind of back and forth all night i didn't see tons of the undercard stuff to be honest with you but let's go straight to the main event now eddie arta baturbiev now 19 and 0 anthony yard now 23 and 3 a defense of baturbiev's ibf wbc wbo light heavyweight titles yard down in the eighth round obviously got back up and then his corner um stopped the fight um i'm gonna come to you first because obviously i feel like you've got probably a lot to say on it i'll give my my two pence afterwards but what did you make of it eddie it was um a very very exciting fight actually already people saying potential fight of the year yeah yeah man i was uh, look the first thing i gotta say is i was really impressed with yard i thought he did an excellent job if anyone says anything otherwise i got something to say about it i think that kid showed a tremendous heart and the ability to adjust a bit at times and try to box, but actually at times also come forward. I think it was a good mix. I think I think he showed a great deal in that fight. He's really he's really world class for sure. I mean, there ain't no doubt about that. Um, to be in there with a killer like Beterbiev and, and and to be able to you know kind of do what he did sometimes coming forward, you know, taking shots, giving shots. You know what I mean? Like taking one to give one sometimes. Might have been a little foolish at times, but um, it, he really got my respect. He did a hell of a job. Uh, the way you know, the, using the jab at times, uh, just in general, man. I love just the just the just the whole the whole performance. I thought was in a loss. I mean, I, I mean, I haven't seen him fight. You know, many other guys. I've seen a Lyndon Arthur fight when he uh, when he stopped him in the second one, but. Um, I don't know if that performance was as good as this one, especially when you think about the competition and who better be, better be of is man. It's, it was, uh, it was, it was really eye opening. He's got a future, you know what I mean? You know, he just got to, got to stay away from some of those punches, but uh, he's got a future in the division. I mean, he really, really looked, he looked awesome. He had better be having trouble at times. You know what I mean? I don't know if he was in like, about to be knocked out trouble, but he had him in trouble. He had him, he had, he had the upper hand, you know what I mean? He was, that, that fight was really, really good. You know what I mean? I, you know, hats off to both guys, uh, obviously better than he's just, he's just a different kind of, different kind of guy. It's going to be really hard to beat him. Even at 38 years old, he's still a very difficult guy to deal with. I don't know what it's going to be if him and uh, the Vol fight, but man, uh, better Bev is going to be tough to get out of there. But I was really, really thoroughly impressed with Anthony Yard and what he did and, and the effort he gave and, and, and trying to do everything he could to win the fight. You know, even getting dropped, trying to get back up and wanting to go on. But what I do, I do respect what his corner did. They just saw like he's getting a little bit tired. You know what I mean? He's he, he, he slugged it out. He, he fought it out. He, gut, he gutted it out the entire time. You know, he, he, they just saw it going downhill maybe, you know, through the next few rounds. I think it was, what, the 10th round, ninth or 10th round? Did I think you got stopped in, eighth. Joey, if I'm not mistaken? Eighth. Oh, it was the eighth. Oh, wow. Well, no wonder. You know what I mean? Because I think, you know, from eight, nine, ten, you know, there's a good amount of rounds left. For him to be in there with this killer that's just coming, coming for blood after a while. So I, I respect what the corner did. Might have been a little little premature in a sense, like not giving them a chance to get back. But I, in my heart of hearts, I understand why they did what they did. They just didn't see an end that was going to be pleasant after more multiple rounds with this guy, not being able to keep him off. Because better be is not going to just sit on the back foot and, and bullshit around. He's going to keep coming forward. He's going to keep coming for the knockout. So if you start to show some weakness, start to get a little tired, it's best 
that they did what they did because if he was started to get to the point where he couldn't defend himself like he should have, it would have just got it would have probably got ugly. But all in all, I thought hell of a performance by that kid. You know, as, as great as Better BF did and how he, you know, he, he came back and, you know, he, he stopped him in the end, I really, really was thoroughly impressed with Adam the Yard. And I, anytime he fights, I'm definitely going to be looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, and not to toot my own horn, but I remember when, you know, we were discussing the fight on last week's show, I was saying that Arta Baturbiev, for me anyway, seems like he slipped just a little bit. Maybe not enough where he's going to lose the fight. Maybe not enough where he's not going to get another stoppage and maintain that 100% streak he's got going. But I felt that I had personally just identified a little bit of slippage there and that maybe if this fight were... You know, were to have happened maybe four or five years ago, it would be a lot harder of a fight for Anthony Yard. And I think personally myself, I'm not sure if you agree with that, Eddie, but I think that the fight for me proved my point a little bit. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah. And that's why I said even at 38, showing that, you know, he's still there. He's still very, very difficult, if not, I don't want to say impossible, but very difficult for anyone to beat, including the role. But yeah. 100%. It, it would be hard for me to believe it, as good as Anthony Yard showed and shown in that fight to believe that he would have been able to do that some years back when he was really fresh. Because, man, he was a killer. He still is a killer. I mean, he's a killer regardless. He's, he's going to be that. But, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I, think you, I think you hit it on the head. But you got to take your hat off to Anthony Yard. No doubt about it. That kid really showed what he's, what he's made of for real. Yeah, just my take on the fight. Um, round one I gave to Anthony Yard. I felt both guys were getting off uh, with left hooks that I didn't really think was a good idea, but I felt Yard you know, had success with his one. So did Baturbiev, but again, I, I did give Yard that round. Baturbiev, I think as well, kind of went into slow motion for a moment after one of the shots that Yard landed. Um, and yeah, like I say, Yard was caught a lot as well to the right on the temple I felt with Baturbiev's big long left hook um but yeah it was a KG you know opening round I felt and my I mean honestly my my heart was racing obviously like I say I know Anthony known him for for a long time haven't spoke to him for a long time sadly I'm not quite sure uh why we kind of drifted but you know I've still obviously got a soft spot for Yard, have done for years, obviously wished him the best in this fight. Um, so, yeah, for me, like, my, my heart was racing. Um, you know, there was there was, um, there, there was a lot of people standing on their seats, not just standing up, but actually standing on their seats. I was one of those guys standing on my seats. Not that there was anyone behind me, by the way, but I was just standing on my seat to, to see, a, you know, in front of the people that were standing on their seats in front of me, like you had to stand on your seat to see it. And once you were standing on your seat, you you could you almost couldn't sit back down. It was it was so exciting from the first bell. Um, round two, I gave to Yard as well. Um, I did think though, Baturbiev was was kind of putting the pressure on Yard mentally, and I think Yard was falling for a lot of feints, you know, um, falling for a lot of those feints, um, coping well, coping well, you know, coping better than maybe I thought he would have been with the pressure, with, with the mental pressure from Baturbiev, but yeah, like I said, I gave the round to Yard, um, again, I felt he maybe might have stunned Baturbiev once or twice in the round, but Baturbiev's legs were so strong, like, whenever he got caught with a shot and you go, oh, did his legs just stiffen a sec there, they'd be back to moving completely fine within about half a second like he just you know every, every time he got caught with a good shot he'd circle around you know, you know do a circle around the ring and he'd, he'd also do it when he clearly didn't take a big shot as well so he was kind of kept kind of doing that circling around and it was to me anyway a bit confusing to know if he'd been hit with a good shot and is that why he's on his bike or was he just doing it regardless whether he took a good shot or not to confuse yard um Yard as well was moving quite a lot in that second round, which I thought, oh no, this isn't good. We don't want to see him on his toes too much. Obviously, you know, we're going to probably see him tire. Um, round three, I gave to Baturbiev. I felt he was starting to close the gap. He was getting closer. Yard as well was throwing singular shots as well at this point. You know, the, the punch output had dropped a little bit. Baturbiev, I felt, was warming into the fight. I felt he possibly might have hurt Yard as well with the last punch or two of the round. It was another left hook, which Yard looked 
open to the entire fight through those first three rounds. Um, round four I gave to Baturbiev as well. Like I say, it seemed like he was coming on uh, a little bit strong, warming into the fight. I felt he hurt Yard as well early on in the round, and he had Yard stuck in the corner momentarily. Um, looked like, you know, the end was near already, but Yard did weather that storm, and he came back. And I wondered if Baturbiev half let him off the hook, or maybe had genuinely punched himself out momentarily. I was a bit unsure of that one, but definitely a Baturbiev round 2-2 two, two I had it. Round 5 was a brilliant round. Honestly, it could be round of the year so far. Um... I gave it to Yard just. I think he landed a fantastic flush shot on Baturbiev. Baturbiev did look quite hurt, but then he came back and hurt Yard. But definitely, like I say, one of the best rounds of the year. Both men were just dishing out punishment and taking punishment. Um, <laughs> even though we were five rounds in, and some people didn't predict it would even go as far as five rounds, you knew already, even though there's only another seven rounds to go, there's no way it's going the distance. Uh, round six I gave to Yard as well. Um, just trying to tally the this up because I haven't actually tallied it up at all. Um, I think I've got it 4-2 to Yard through 6, which seems a little bit biased. Maybe it was. Round 7 I gave to Baturbiev. Again, both men were hurt. Yard looked ready to go at one point for me. Yard would take a great shot to the chin, look a bit stunned. Uh, Baturbiev as well would, would whip in a brutal body shot. Every time he landed a good shot on Yard's chin and Yard would look at like he's in a bit of trouble, he'd just go straight downstairs with a brutal shot to the body, man. It was it was, it was was terrible but proper breaking yard yard down to the body um another round of the year candidate there in round seven um and i was already kind of thinking this could possibly be the best fight i've been at in person it was a great fight through the first seven rounds and then of course unfortunately for yard round eight was was it was a miserable round he was down he got back up he was very slow um i haven't watched the replay back or anything like that like i say i've only seen it from being there in person but when he went down he got back up he was very very slow looked at his corner um you know he looked like he was in porridge he was so slow his body language from what i could see was awful um the referee was saying, like, you know, because he, he kind of walked towards his corner when he got back up and was he walked back there as if it was the end of the round. Like, he had his back to the rest of the ring. And the referee saying, you know, turn around, you've got to carry on here. And um, he kind of barely carried on, didn't he? Put his arms up to say, yep, I can protect myself and kind of walk forward really slowly. But Terbiev, of course, knew Yard was massively hurt, went in for the kill, landed two, I think it was two massive shots. And I felt that the KO's coming any second now. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be brutal. Yard is going to sleep here. And then that was when his trainer, Tunde Ajayi, friend of the show as well, uh, stepped up on the top rope and stopped the fight. Anthony Yard was angry initially. Um, I don't know if he's changed his stance on that since then, but I felt straight away Tunde Ajayi, the trainer, was 100% right to stop the fight. Um... Yeah, I think a, a brutal knockout was coming. And as you say, Eddie, you know, we were in round eight here, not round 11 or round 12. There was a long way to go still. And Baturbiev had really warmed into it by that point and didn't look like he was slowing down. Um, just last sentence on the fight, Eddie. Um, did you think that the corner made the right choice to stop the fight? I think you do. A million percent. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I think as, as good as he was doing it, as tough as he is, you got to protect him from himself. And I think his corner was smart and it showed they really care and they really know he got a future and they didn't want to mess it up by putting him in there and trying to be too brave, you know, in this, in this scenario. So I'm happy to see they did that and congratulations to the whole team. They, they got a good future. Absolutely. We wish him all the best in the future, Anthony Yard. But that brings part one to a close. The final thing for me to do is to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBA super lightweight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. Mario Barrios. Mario, welcome back on the show, my man. Thanks for having me again, man. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure having you on, Mario. It truly is. We last spoke in February of last year, so almost a year, man. Uh, the reason we haven't spoken is because, obviously, you haven't boxed since the Furman fight. We did an interview, I think, in the build-up to the fight. We haven't spoken since, like I say, almost a year. Let me take you back briefly to that Furman fight. We didn't know what Furman had left. It turns out, I think he had a lot more than some people thought he had left. But just walk me through the fight, if you can, Mario. Obviously... Um, yeah, tough way to start your campaign at 147. 
Uh, yeah, you know, um, we knew, um, you know, Thurman was no, you know, was no easy fight. Uh, but, you know, we took the fight regardless, you know, because, like I said, you know, I wanted to, you know, test myself and uh, test my abilities. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, uh, you know, he proved, you know, to still be a a really tough contender. You know, we, we went at it for, you know, the full 12 rounds. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, uh, I fell short, but, um, um, I, you know, I still think, you know, regardless of what, you know, what happened in that fight, I still think it was a, a, a good move, you know, for me and my team, you know, to try and, you know, test myself right away. And, um, you know, I feel like, you know, we, I still have so much to accomplish and, uh, so much to show the, the boxing world. And obviously, not many fighters would go f- straight from a Javante Tank Davis fight right in with Keith Furman. Obviously, that was uh, something a lot of guys wouldn't do, especially at the you know at the point of of your career that you're in. Um, in hindsight, obviously, it was it was very risky going in with Furman, but it sounds like you don't. You, it's not a move that you regret. No, no. It's, it's, like I said, I mean, it's it's not a move that you know I, I regret at all. Um, you know, we fought, You like I said, we fought the full 12 rounds. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was still a very competitive fight. And, uh, you know, it's not a fight where I was just completely blown out, you know. So I got to see right away, you know, where where, you know, where I stood, uh, you know, competing, you know, with the with, with the top level. And um, so, I mean, we were able to take a lot from, uh, you know, from that fight. And, you know, just um, I, after that fight, you know, I took a I took a couple of months off, you know, just to rest, you know, my mind and body, and um, and yeah, you know, I, was, uh, I started training again, you know, but, um, that hunger it, it never left, uh, you know, that passion, you know, for you know for the sport, and you know, I'm excited, you know, to just be, you know, um, ending this layoff that I have had. And I was going to ask as well, Mario, what have you mainly been up to in that almost year out of the ring? I know, obviously, you've left um, you've left Virgil Hunter. You're now with a new trainer. Tell me about that and what you've been up to with the rest of the 11 and a bit months off. Uh, yeah, you know, right right after you know that Derma fight, I took um, I took two two to three months off, you know, from from boxing, you know, which is the most I have ever taken off. You know, it's just like I said, you know, just to rest my mind, my body. Uh, I had two, you know, really, really competitive and really, you know, um, really intense training camps, you know, back to back, you know, with the, with the tank and Thurman fight. And, uh, you know, it felt nice to just, you know, kind of reset, um, you know, me, me and Verge, we, um, I, uh, you know, I'm no longer working with him, but you know, like I said, um, you know, I'm very thankful, you know, for everything, you know, we had accomplished together and, you know, everything, you know, that he had, um, that you know he had an um and a direct impact with you know a direct uh a uh i can't think of the word but you know just i'm i'm just you know so thankful you know for for virgil and you know for all the years that i got to spend out there in the in the bay area um it's still you know all love you know we still talk uh here and there and uh but yeah so i mean i'm I'm training in vegas with a uh, bob santos um you know who's always been part of my team um he was the person you know who worked my head corner before virgil and you know even when i was working with virgil you know he was still involved in um, my corner and uh you know i decided to make the move to vegas because you know i believe these next few years you know my career are going to be you know the most important uh i'm still using 27 you know still just reaching my prime and, you know, this is when, you know, I'm looking, you know, to make, um, you know, an, an even bigger impact, you know, than uh, than what I had these last few years. Okay, no, it's good to hear that you and Virgil are still cool. Obviously, a lot of fighters leave their, their, their trainer on bad terms. It's good that that's not the case. Um, yeah, your next fight takes place February 11th in San Antonio, Texas at the Alamo Dome. You'll be boxing former Adrian Broner foe, Giovanni Santiago. If I remember correctly, he gave Broner a real close fight. What else do we know about Santiago, Mario? You know, like how you said, you know, he, he gave you know, Broner a really competitive fight. Uh, he's not somebody I'm taking lightly at all. And, um, you know, I think, you know, just him, um, you know, one, just just taking the fight against me, you know, in San Antonio, you know, I think that, you know, that shows a lot on uh, on his part, you know, that shows, you know, he's coming, um, you know, he's not coming all the way to San Antonio, San Antonio just to lay down, you know, I know he's going to be ready. And, um, 
but it's just my job to, to go in there, you know, be smarter, you know, and um, and execute my game plan and everything, you know, that I have been working on, you know, um, out here in Vegas. And a win here against Santiago Mario, what does this do for you? Is it is it just a fight to get you back to winning ways, to maybe brush off the cobwebs, as they say, um, you know, just for you to be able to push on from? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, I think it's that, you know, I think a win, you know, it just puts me, in, um, you know, it just gets me, you know, another step closer, you know, to fighting, you know, the best in my division. And, um, but, you know, more importantly, you know, I'm just, you know, looking forward, you know, to ending, you know, this layoff. Uh, I'm very excited, you know, to be back in front of my hometown crowd. And, um, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm thankful, you know, to Al Heyman, uh, to PBC, you know, my managers. Uh, you know, just for, you know, the the opportunity again, you know, to go out there and uh, display my skills. And despite being inactive, you've maintained a world ranking with the WBC. I think you're currently sitting at 10th. Um, will you be going down the WBC route, Mario? Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, yeah, well, we're going to go any any route that we can, you know, that, um, you know, to get as close, you know, to a title shot, you know, as... Um, as you know, as quick as we can, you know that's uh, that's the ultimate goal is um, to win an, another world title. And it looks like we might actually see Javante Tank Davis get in with Ryan Garcia. If it happens, how do you see it playing out, Mario? I think uh, it's going to be a very competitive fight. You know, they're both very explosive. Um, you know, I, I am going to lean with uh, with Tank. You know. Um, Probably you know late in the the, the later round. It, it's not a fight that I see going going the distance, but it's a fight you know I I would lean you know with Tank. You know we shared the uh, we shared the ring for eleven rounds. You know I know what he's capable of. I mean, he's a very you know tricky and a very intelligent fighter. Um you know along with his you know very dangerous uh, explosive. Yes, yeah, a great fight. Hopefully we do see it get made. Looks like it could be happening real soon. And just finally, my man, before we let you go, if you've got any closing words, Mario, like I say, almost a year we haven't had you on, but whenever whenever I get you on, it really makes my day, makes my week. It's great always speaking with you. What's your closing message, my man? Uh, just, you know, I'm very, you know, thankful for you, you know, thankful for, you know, for everybody else who, you know, has continued to, you know, support me, you know, through um, through my whole career, you know, through this, this little break that I took. And, you know, I'm looking forward, you know, like I said, you know, to just getting back, you know, bringing, you know, great fights, you know, to uh, to the world of boxing. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited, you know, everybody tune in February 11th. Everybody tune in February 11th. Mario, as always, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my man. Best of luck for February 11th in San Antonio, back at home. And we'll speak afterwards, I'm sure. Uh, definitely, Joey. I appreciate you, my man. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this piece of news. April the 1st, Rabisi Ramirez gets in with friend of the show, Isaac Dogbay. That's going to be at Featherweight, of course. Um, it's going to be a really good fight, that. It's going to be at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Tulsa. On the undercard, we're going to see uh, heavyweight prospect Jeremiah Milton. Uh, we're also going to see... Um, Xander Zayas as well on the card there. So again, that's on ESPN Plus April the 1st in Tulsa. All the best, of course, to Isaac Dogbe in the away corner here. Um, what else do we have? What else do we have? It's official. I saw them both in the ring when they when they uh, did their first face-off, I believe it was. But yeah, Jake Paul and Tommy Fury. That one to go down February the 26th, which is actually a Sunday in Diria in Saudi Arabia. Um, crazy, crazy. I mean, I'm kind of excited for it, really, because I guess we're going to finally get to see the fight. But um, it's it's you know it's a circus, and um, Jake Paul has actually opened as the massive, massive favorite in the fight. So the bookies do not see Tommy Fury winning that one, and especially not by knockout. I think Tommy Fury to win by knockout is about six to one or something crazy like that. So um, yeah, madness. Um. What else do we have? Um, former world champion, friend of the show, good friend of the show, Brandon Figueroa. Um, his his next fight's been announced for March the 4th. He gets in with another former world champion, another friend of the show, the Philippines, Mr. Mark Magsayo. That one again, um, March the 4th, that one. And it takes place, um, where is it? It takes place, I think, 
I think in in um, California, if I'm not mistaken, um, I should know, but yeah, I think it's I think it is in in California. But on the undercard as well, Jarrett Hurd returns to action. It's good to see him back. He's been massively inactive, it seems like, in recent years. But yeah, great main event I think there between um, Mark Magseo and and Brandon Figueroa. Hopefully, get one of the guys on the show before the fight. Um, and then, yeah, just the final piece of news is that the heavyweight um, Justice Hooney from, um, I think he's from Australia, yeah, 7-0 and with four KOs. He's just signed a promotional deal with Matchroom. That's been announced just a matter of hours ago, actually. So, um, yeah, that's the latest piece of news that we have for you and the last piece of news that we have for you. So that is it for the news. Moving on now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. It takes place later tonight at the Montreal Casino in Quebec, Canada. It's going to be on ESPN Plus over here. Two fights to mention. Let's start with the undercard. Um... Eves Ulysse Jr., 22 and 2, in a 10 rounder here against Gabriel Valenzuela, 25 and 3, with a draw. Um, like I say, over 10, over 10 rounds. Eves Ulysse Jr., a fighter that I was quite high on at one stage, I think when he beat Cleta Seldin years ago, but um, he lost a fight to. Oh, God, I forgot the guy's name. Don't want to go check it, but off the top of my head, the guy. Um, I think had been in there with Anthony Crawler from um, South America somewhere. Forgot the guy's name, but you know he was quite old and he beat Eves Jalice. It was a bit of a shock. I think maybe two or three years ago. So since he lost to that guy there, um, I've I've kind of been a little bit skeptical actually on him since then. Um, I've got to check the guy's name now because it's going to annoy me if I don't otherwise. But he lost to. Ishmael Barroso, yeah, so like I say, obviously former opponent of Anthony Crawler. Um, anyway, the main event, all eyes to the main event for the NABF and NABA super middleweight titles. Over here we've got the undefeated Eric um, Bazinian, who's 28-0. and um, Eric Bazinian as well, um, you know, a fighter that that's being spoken up and there's a lot of hype around him as well, obviously, you know, born in Europe but based these days in Canada um I think he was a fairly decent amateur if I'm not mistaken but yeah you know as a pro quite flawless 28 and 0 21 KOs he gets in with friend of the show one of my really uh top friends in boxing really Alontes Fox Alontes Sly as a Fox 28 and 3 with 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 a draw um it's going to be tough for fox really cuz obviously he's like a bit of a road warrior now but his recent form hasn't been great you know getting stopped by david morell last time out which you know was was over a year ago now so he's coming off 13 or 14 months of inactivity and he got stopped against morell he got you know he got battered in that fight really um and i don't want to see that for alontes fox obviously 6 foot 5 i think he is really good boxer and stuff but just unfortunately hasn't been able to show what he can do in in you know in the biggest fights of his career and um it's a fight again i think he could win but it's a tough one man and um like i say he's not going to get any favors on the road he's the away fighter he's he's obviously not a puncher as well which everyone knows and He's going to have to box his backside off, really, to win this fight. So um, all the best to him, but it's a must-win fight. It honestly is, and even though he's a friend of mine, I've got to tell it straight. I've got to, I've got to be honest. It's a last-chance saloon, really. If you lose here to this guy, then I don't know where you go from here, man. So I wish him all the best. I hope he can win the fight, of course, Alontes Fox. All the best to him. Um, so there's fights on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week, um, and... We're going to move now to Friday. This one also takes place on ESPN Plus. So there's boxing on on ESPN Plus on Thursday and Friday. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about this card here. Let's start with the undercard first. It's a top ranked show at the Desert Diamond Arena in Glendale, Arizona. Over here, um, Emiliano Vargas two and zero gets in with Francisco Duque, who's 1-1, one and one. that's over four rounds there, we've got Nico Ali Walsh, the grandson of, of course, Muhammad Ali, 7-0 and oh in a six-rounder here against Eduardo Ayala, who's 9-2 and two with a draw, we also have on the card the winner of, um, of, of the Box Hard Podcast Knockout of the Year 2022 um, award, 
Richard Torres Jr., 4 0, 4 KOs. He gets in with James Bryant, who's 6 and 2. Um, elsewhere on the card, a really good fight as well here for Arnold Barboza Jr., 27 and 0. In a real big step up here to world level in a 10 rounder against Jose Pedraza, who's 29 and 4 with a draw. Certainly on the, on the slide now, Pedraza, but still has enough about him. He's a wily old fox, still has enough about him to, to, um, to beat some top guys. Like I say, I think he's definitely been on the slide maybe the last year or two, and it could be the right time for Barboza to beat him. But, you know, both guys prime for prime. I, I definitely side with Pedraza, but I don't think we're going to see that on, on, on Friday night. But all the best to him. I've always been a big fan of Pedraza's. And the main event, Emmanuel Navarrete, 36-1. and one. I think he goes for his third world title in three different weight classes, if I'm not mistaken. He's up here at Super Featherweight. Um, I remember him beating uh, Isaac Dogbe at Super Bantam. So, yeah, I think he went from Super Bantam to Feather. Now he's up at Super Feather. Um, he fights for the vacant WBO title, a title vacated. I think it was by Shakur Stevenson. He gets in with Australia's very own Liam Wilson, 11-1. and one. The one loss um, he avenged, uh, I think it was to Joe Noine. Um, but... To be totally honest, I don't know tons about Liam Wilson. It was a guy that I was having a little look at because at one point he was going to be fighting a friend of the show, friend of mine, Archie Sharp. That fight obviously fell through. They were going to be fighting in a final eliminator to fight the winner of Navarrete and Oscar Valdez. Valdez pulled out the fight. Navarrete um, was without an opponent and Liam Wilson left Archie Sharp without an opponent to take on Navarrete straight for the title. So he skipped the Archie Sharp fight. He gets a crack at a world title. Can't blame him. Excellent managerial move from his team. Um, but he does jump in with Emmanuel Navarrete, who is, for me, one of the best fighters, really. I don't think he's creeping into anyone's top 10 pound for pound list, but certainly gives everyone a nightmare of a fight and he's just cruising through the weights without much of an issue um, I don't know where we're going to see him end up at the end of his career what weight I do not know but um, Liam Wilson's a big big boy actually for super featherweight so that could be interesting but Navarrete just being that relentless Mexican madman that he is I think he will get to Wilson um, if I had to be pushed for a prediction I'd say probably stops Wilson late but <laughs> I think he wins the fight, Navarrete. I don't think there's any danger of Wilson, you know, stunning him, shocking him, upsetting him. But um, it's a case for me of if we're going to see Navarrete get the stoppage or go to points, um, I'd lean towards the stoppage, like I say. Um, I think that's what the bookies expect as well. But it, it should be a good fight. I do enjoy watching Navarrete fight. All the best to Liam Wilson. I mean, he'd shock the world if he can win. Good luck to him. Got nothing against him. Uh, moving out now to this one that takes place on Saturday. We're now at the final two cards. This one takes place at the Loom Color Phoenix Center in Ontario, California. Um, I think that's pronounced properly. But over here, friend of the show, Ernesto Mercado. 8-0 with 8 KOs. I think he's got seven of the eight KOs within the first two rounds. He's that amazing amateur who was like a 22-time national champion or whatever he was. I think his record as, a, as an amateur was about 290 and 10. Um, he's been on the show. He was supposed to be taking on Hank Lundy on this date here, but obviously Hank pulled out the fight, um, momentarily had the Broner fight pinned down, but then <laughs> didn't end up getting that fight either. But anyway, Back to Ernesto Mercado. He steps in with the late replacement opponent, Jose Angulo, who's 14 and 4. It's for the NABA USA Super Lightweight title. Um, all the best to Mercado. I don't think he's going to have much of an issue here. Probably be 9 0 with 9 KOs by this time next week. And the main event of. Uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that one, but I was going to move to the next card. It takes place at the Madison Square Garden Theatre, the mecca of boxing in New York, USA. Let's start with the undercard. We've got the UK's very own Ramla Ali, um, the, the Muslim female fighter, 7-0. and It's for the vacant IBF Intercontinental Super Bantamweight title over 10 two-minute rounds against Avril Maffey, who is 8-0 and with a draw. So some somebody's O must go there. Um, elsewhere on the card, good fight here as well between Shadacia Green, I could be saying that wrong, 11-0, and Ellen Sederuz, who's 8-1. I think a former world champion or maybe a former world title challenger, Sederuz, I believe she was on that card um, that I was at with you, if I'm not mistaken, Eddie. You wouldn't remember, but I think she boxed on that um, Shields Habazin undercard, if I'm not mistaken. But she's 
um, having a fight here against Green for the for the WBC Silver Super Middleweight title over 10 two-minute rounds. We've also got Sky Nicholson, friend of the show, obviously from Australia, um, 5-0. and She gets in with Tanya Alvarez, who's 7-0. and Again, somebody's O must go. These, these ladies on this card being um, very, um, you know, well-matched. It seems like we're going to see some good female fighters here. It's for the vacant WBC silver featherweight title. Um, yeah, I really like the fact that they're showcasing women's boxing again on a big card like this. And all the fights seem to be real closely matched. Um, we've also got Alicia Baumgardner as well. 13-1 and one defending her titles. Um, I think... I'm not sure, I can't remember if she's undisputed or not, but anyway, she gets in with Elam McCallid, who is 15 and 1, it's for the IBF, IBO, WBA, WBC and WBO Super Featherweight World titles, I think the WBA is vacant, but yeah, this is literally for all the marbles, it's an undisputed fight, I think McCallid may hold one of the titles, but it doesn't really matter, it's over 10 two minute rounds, it's going to be good to see Baumgartner out again, um, you know, coming off that controversial points win against Michaela Mayer and the main event it almost seems mad to say there's a there's a a male fight on this car but it's a good male fight as well very evenly matched fight in terms of the two guys on paper we're going to see Richardson Hitchens 15 and 0 get in with John Bowser who's 17 and 0 that's over 10 rounds there at super lightweight for the IBF North American and WBC United States titles and then the main event Amanda Serrano de Puerto Rico, Eddie, 43 and 2 with a draw, gets in with Erica Cruz, who's 15 and 1. Again, it's for all the marbles the IBF, the IBO, the WBA, the WBC, and the WBO featherweight female world titles over 10 two minute rounds. Always fantastic to see Amanda Serrano um, have a fight. You know, I've been a massive fan of hers for, for, for years. Um, it looks like we're going to see the Katie Taylor rematch perhaps. And that's certainly something in the distance for her. She actually came out this week and just sent an apologizing tweet to her opponent here, Erica Cruz, and just said, look, I'm not overlooking you. There's a lot of talk about myself and Katie Taylor, but it's it's meant, you know, in 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 a respectful way. I'm not overlooking you whatsoever, and um, just really a tweet to kind of put out to let the world know that she's not disrespectfully dismissing her opponent here. She rates her. It's a test. It's a challenge, and of course, anything can happen in that ring. Um, so yeah, Amanda Serrano. There's not much more to say. She is the star of the show, rightfully so. A hell of a fighter. And um, I cannot wait to see her box once again, like I say. But that's about it, though, for the preview part of the show. I don't think Eddie's had to say anything in part two there. But in part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest. In part two, we did the news. There was a, quite a bit of news to go over. And then in, 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 in the very end there of part two, we did the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 381 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to this week's special guest, the former WBA super lightweight world champion, Mr. Mario Barrios. Really good guy he is, as I'm sure you all know. Good luck to him and his fight coming up. Um, in just nine days now. Uh, the biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. There has been one piece of news break whilst we've been recording the show, and it's that the juggernaut, Mr. Joe Joyce, will be back in action. He gets in with Zili Zhang um, of China, the six foot six Southpaw Chinese heavyweight. That one to go down at the Copper Box Arena in uh, in London, of course, on April 15th. So do not blink. I think Joe Joyce wins that one easy. That's a terrible style matchup, I think, there for Zhang. But um, should be exciting. Always good to see Joe Joyce fight, of course. And it's, a, it's another step in the right direction for him. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe. And we'll see you all again next week. <laughs>